whatever line I'm reading, keep it keep it right up there. Simon Thanks. Townsend's Wonderworld episode double three one stroke one key number XC nine six two five recorded the eighteenth of the third eighty six the transmission on the seventh of the fourth eighty six Melbourne Sydney Brisbane Adelaide. to my wonder world. Irish. The Irish people have two great things about them. The Irish have a superb sense of humour and they talk a lot and that's why Irish comedians are beloved all around the world. And now, did you hear the one about the Irish comedian who met the wonder world reporter? No? Well, I'll let Hugh Munro explain. <laughs> Paul has already won three Mo Awards for Best Irish Australian Comedian. <laughs> You're pretty short for a comedian. Do people call you a leprechaun ever? There's no such thing as leprechauns, you? Oh, aren't there? No, no, no. Oh. Um, well, <laughs> Irish jokes are very simple. Why is that? So that Australians can understand them. That's why. That is why. What are you doing? I took me medicine this morning and I forgot to shake the bottle. Have you seen the Irish movie with John Wayne, The Quiet Man? Yes, and Barry Fitzgerald, and he said, Ah, no, Mr. Wayne, what seems to be the problem? And John Wayne said, It's sure lonesome in the saddle since the horse died. Or for our Japanese viewers, Yakasuya Hawahaka. Ha, ha, ha. Stating the obvious is one of the main ingredients of good Irish humour. A typical example is a friend of mine, Mickrick, back in Ireland. He started the takeaway food. Long before McDonald's in Ireland, we had McMickrick's. He used to serve soup in a basket, Irish stew on a stick, and he used to say the obvious. He'd say things like, I saw you the other day, but by the time I caught up with you, you'd gone. Or he'd say, are you reading that paper you're sitting on? And once he worked at the airport and used to pick suitcases up and say, follow me, I'll be right behind you. Hey, Paul, can you check and see if my indicators are working? Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Here we are sitting on an Irish bench. Does it remind you of your homeland? It does. I was back in September, you know. Got in a bit of trouble with teddy boys. They attacked me with razors. <laughs> I was so pleased they weren't plugged in. Oh, oh. <laughs> what's, what's this for? It's an Irish toothpick. I shouldn't have asked. No. What about this? That's a shillelagh. What does it do? Well, doctors use them to test your reflexes. <laughs> You've got the job. If an Irish eagle's wingspan is two metres when it's flying away from the sun, what is it when it's flying into the sun? I don't know. One metre. <laughs> Why is it whenever you ask an Irishman a question, he always answers you with a question? Who told you that? Boom. What makes Irish humour so different? Well, Irish people have a uniqueness that they don't mind laughing at themselves. Oh, well, how about this joke? Um, did you hear about the Irish dog who walked backwards wagging its head? <laughs> Here at St Michael's Golf Course, they have big St Patrick's Day celebrations. They will indeed. There'll be five people here at least. Oh, well, enough time to take in a bit of golf. How can I lengthen my drive? Well, what you do, Hugh, is you hit the ball and run backwards. We both turned up for the St Patrick's Day celebration, but we it did. seems nobody else did. No. Did I tell you about my car? Don't tell me it's an Irish car, right? Oh, it is an Irish car. Every Sunday we take it for a push. Did you know that Simon's got a counterpart in Ireland? What's his name? Simon McTown's front. <laughs> and remember, the world really is wonderful. <laughs> Isn't it, McWoodrow? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I think they're sending us up. <laughs> now, in the words of William Shakespeare, here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. In other words, it's time for a music clip. And the one you're about to see is the epitome of fun and colour and energy and laughter. It's called Open Mind and it's by the very gifted violinist Jean-Luc Ponty. And visually, it's among the best music clips ever. It's filmed at a Carnavali. Bit itchy, are you, mate? And that's where all the people are dressed in the most outlandish costumes. It's just sensational.
Diwali. It'd be fun to be there, wouldn't it? I'll be back right after a short break with a record breaker and then a film story on how to convert a car into a convertible. Complete this saying from Little Acorns. From Little Acorns, mighty oak trees grow. Yes, indeed. Today's record breaker is uh, Nadine Ismay and she says in her letter, Simon, I have represented the Metropolitan running team twice and I came first and then I came third, a champion runner. Good on you Nadine. For you the Guinness Book of Records, and have a look at this, this is something I like to show you. This is um, the official Guinness uh, Book of Records certificate and it looks exactly like this and this is what you get if you break a record, a Guinness World Record. Looks terrific, look great hanging up on your wall, wouldn't it? Right, car conversions. Convertibles, they're uh, cars without tops. They're really great fun, especially on a sunny day with the sun shining on your face and the fresh air and the wind blowing in your hair. It's absolutely wonderful. Now, some convertibles start life as normal hardtop cars. And then someone lops off the top and makes them into convertibles. How? Here's a lass with the wind in her hair, Edith Bliss. Jump in my car. I wanna take you home. If you love the common garden variety Volkswagen, then chances are that you'll just adore the converted version. Jump in my car. I wanna take you home. The basic strength of a V-dub car comes from its roof and its floor pan, which is this part that you see underneath the car. So if you're going to cut the roof off, which is the first thing you have to do to convert a car, obviously it will crumble because it'll be so much weaker than it should be. But there is a way around it. What you do is you strengthen up the floor pan by putting in a chassis frame. And that's all of those beams that you see here. See how much they strengthen underneath? Before you cut the roof off the car, you have to create a cutting line, and you do this by laying out masking tape. Well, this is what the car looks like with the top cut off it, and now it's time for its first real facelift because it's going to go into the paint shop to be painted. Now, it's a spray paint that's an acrylic enamel and it has its own built-in gloss, so with only one coat of paint, it'll come out looking like a brand spanking new car. <laughs> After painting, the car comes into the fitting and finishing bay where it's detailed. Now, detailing means putting all of those fine touches on that bring the car up to showroom condition. Now, they even replace the engine. So what you really do end up with is a brand new car. The man responsible for giving new life to the old V-dub is Charlie Gergen, who before taking this on, had spent most of his life in a career in boxing. It started off with Charlie being a champion boxer himself, and then from there, he went on to train other champions. Rudy Koopman, Tony Mundine, Pat Hallywood, and his current protege, Roy Bajerk, who is about to try for the title of Australian cruiserweight champion. Oh, I thought that was absolutely wonderful, Charlie. But tell me, how does a former boxer get involved in remodelling Volkswagens? Well, that's my job. I'm a bodybuilder. So as well as building people's bodies, you build car bodies? That's right. But why the Volkswagen? Maybe I've got a bit of soft spot for the old country. Oh, I think there might be a bit of that in there. And how much will it cost for a converted car? Top of the range, about $14,000. 
And top of the range means that you get a beautiful car fitted out with all sorts of special features like a dicky seat for the passengers, tinted windows, beautiful upholstery inside in contrasting colours, a sporty steering wheel, absolutely the works. It's fantastic. Get out of my car. I love them. Aren't they terrific? Coming up, a story on the Party Girls uh, band. It's an all-girls band and they're terrific. That's after this commercial break. Think about this. Have a good think about this. If you had to spend the next 30 years on a desert island, who would you want to share it with? Think about that. The first meat eaten on the moon was one roast beef sandwich, two roast turkey, three roast pork and apple sauce. Well, the answer is roast turkey, the first meat eaten on the moon. Yes, indeed. All girl bands come and go, and sometimes they're interesting and sometimes they're not, but I guess it's always a gimmick to have nothing but females in a rock band. Now, one Australian group is starting to make a name for themselves, and they are the Party Girls. And this is their first television appearance in a music clip. And your reporter is Brett Clements. You say to me, there's too much pressure in your life. You say to me, there's not much pleasure in your life. I only know what you tell me. With a name like the Party Girls and a record punched out on Think vinyl, thanks ladies. What else would you expect but an all-lady lineup? But they're one of the first female groups which is really coming to the fore in Australian music. Can we do that again? <laughs> Party Girls are a seven-piece Sydney-based band and their first self-titled album sold 1,000 copies in only three days. And yep, you guessed it, a pink lyric sheet. And they not only look good, they sound good too. I only know what you tell me. I'll never know. What's the Party Girls all about? It's a crash. It's fun. It's a scream. A blast. It's exciting. It's wonderful. It's bizarre. It's a party! You're all in your early 20s, but collectively you've had about 70 years experience in playing musical instruments. Some of us started very early. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you still get a lot of flack because you're an all-female lineup? Oh, no, not anymore. You know, when people come to see us, they recognise the band as, you know, what it is, which is just a, a good rock band. Hi, I'm Vita, and I play rhythm guitar! Hi, I'm Toot, and I play trumpet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pam, and I play sax. I squeeze basil, and I play bass! Yay! <laughs> I'm Weasel and I play lead guitar. Hi, I'm Bongo and I play drums. Hi, I'm Nancy and I sing Hi, I'm Silver! the party girls. It's time for a news hound report. Today's news hound is Stefan Lendnell and uh, his report uh, to me is on some of his hobbies and collections. He says, Simon, I collect coins, pine cones, cotton reels, corks and stickers. My hobbies are practicing magic, making things, woodworking and drawing. As you can imagine, Simon, I'm very busy and that's how I like to be. 
Good on you, Stefan. They're terrific. I've got a really fantastic gift for you today. I've never given this away before. This is a set of seven Walt Disney limited gold videos. And these are a real collector's item because each video contains scenes of a Walt Disney uh, character and it's, each one comes in its own special volume. And uh, none of these have uh, ever been released in Australia before. And the whole magnificent set comes to you from a company called Walt Disney Home Video. They're quite terrific. And there's seven of them there. I'll be back with a fascinating story about a fascinating career. It's the career of taxidermy. Simon loves to reply to your letters, but remember you must also send a second envelope. And this second envelope must have your name and your address on it. And it must have another stamp on it too. If you want your photo, returned by Simon. <laughs> The enterprising Italians have invented 150 different pasta shapes. How amazing. <laughs> I love pasta. Here's a film story now about the job of a taxidermist. Now, taxidermy is the art of stuffing dead animals. A taxidermist takes the body of a dead animal, removes all the innards and guts and stuff, and stuffs it and mounts it so that people can look at it usually in museums. It's an unusual job, but it's an interesting one. Your reporter is Wednesday Kennedy. Well, if you thought taxidermy had something to do with disease, taxi drivers, you're wrong. It's actually the process of stuffing and restoring dead animals. To mount an animal, you first start with taking a skin from a dead animal and tanning it, which means soaking the skin in chemicals and then blow drying it. This prevents the skin from rotting. A mould is then made of the animal, or in this case, the gorilla's head, and the mould is filled with two chemicals which bubble up and harden into polyurethane foam. The head is then taken out of the mould and the skin is mounted. Taxidermists also reassemble the skeletons of animals. All those skeletons you see when you visit your museum have all had the muck scraped off them so they're squeaky clean and then put back together with wire and glue. Taxidermists also add features to their animals such as eyes. This is the eye of a kangaroo and this is the eye of a bird. It's important that these animals are refashioned in a lifelike manner, so these birds are modelled in the same position as they were when they were tweeting around in the garden, and this shark is being painted so it looks exactly the same as it was when it was swimming around in the ocean. Why do you feel that preserving these animals is important? Well, I think a collection of preserved animals are quite interesting to look at and also have great educational value. Do you feel that the job of um, stuffing animals is a bit morbid? Well, let's face it, you can't afford to be schemish, but um, the work is very interesting and rewarding. Whoa, if I could talk to the animals, just imagine it, chatting with a chim chimpanzee. Imagine talking to a tiger, chatting with a cheetah. What a neat achievement this would be. Do you ever stuff human heads? Only on my day, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh dear, oh dear. Good story. You guys weren't at all interested in that, were you? No. That's the show for today, but very quickly, before I go, how about this for Minute? This tiny little leather shoe is made from calf skin and it measures a mere 1.2 centimetres long. That's less than half an inch. It's a fantastic little miniature, isn't it? Because it's complete in every detail, right down to the heel and the sole and the eyes and the stitching and the shoelaces. It's quite, quite extraordinary. It took 40 hours to complete making that. And it, 
Please don't rip my pieces of paper. Really quite marvellous. I think it's more proof that the world really is wonderful. Goodbye, Winston. skeleton jump off the cliff. Why he did the skeleton jump off the cliff. He had no guts.